And Lord, that when we leave this place, that you'll be preparing our hearts for the opportunity to share your word. Or for the opportunities to minister to other people. Lord, let you be our focus. And that we not have our eyes straight from being fixed on you. But we love you in your place, God. In your sense. Amen. Now to see those are soon as we're talking to you.
Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Huh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a god, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm running out of playing games. Why are you so much in playing games? You are not. What gave it away? You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I did that. You don't have I did, I did. <laughs> Hey, what are we doing? I'm mean, gonna make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay, got it. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm gonna use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up here. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Mm -hmm. Speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? I <laughs> showed up in my 20s and grow around and came back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually taught me to try Pilates. That was awkward. But I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here, maybe four, maybe eight lines right here, that would be awesome. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. All I'm saying is, most people when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So, do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel? No, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I can bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, compare yourself to others instead of me. I'll tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it any time I want. <laughs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I gotta admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work, and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, but I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends, they're like, oh, you're holier than that. You know? And I don't, I don't think it's just bring people to the festival. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here, and then, you That's know. That's just that you never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me. Whenever you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things or life, or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control. No, chisel, chisel. chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to when you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. See, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. But you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever going to hear is at the end of your life, when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant, that's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize. Heavenward. Oh, it hurts. Oh, trust me. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I just I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin. But I also did it for another reason. To give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years. These empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them, and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Allow me to produce a character when you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, then we went another way. Your ways are not my ways. I can't. You can't. I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. 
it's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning, I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah. Do you know what? Oh, what? No one is nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, uh, I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up.
is so strange for the God who loved us enough to make us, loved us enough to split time, to come into the world, to save us, to forgive us, to redeem us. God who loved us enough at the moment our willingness to embrace Him as our Savior, as our Lord, put His Spirit to live inside of us. That God who loved us enough to do all of that is the God that we find it so hard to let go of some things in our life find it so hard that the God who loves us beyond what we could even express with words, we don't trust Him with our very lives. That all. This morning we're going to talk very briefly about one of those areas in which it's often hard for us to trust God. We're going to talk about trusting God with our finances. Now, before I even start, this is always a sermon that I'm very reluctant to give. It's a topic in which I don't particularly like to talk about because I know sometimes as we begin to talk about trusting God with our money, we automatically begin to think that the preacher is trying to put his money into your wallet so he can pull something out to put into his. I want to assure you that's not the case. Right? I said this um, in the previous service. I want to remind you of this. We have a finance committee that is elected by our church. They oversee the finances of our congregation. I'm an ex officio on that committee. For those of you who don't know what an ex officio is, it means I get to voice my opinion, but I don't get a vote. All right, now listen to me carefully means that you as a church body, as a church family, you elect on a committee people who oversee our finances, and they do an awesome job. They watch over what we spend. They watch over what we do out, and they keep us from being poor stewards of what God has blessed through your contributions. So there is never a time when I will ever come before you and ask you to give up something so that I can get more. I promise you that. God has been so very good to Misty and I. Um, we have every need met through the graciousness of this body and oh, through the awesome grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we have always had our needs met. Within the first year of our marriage, Missy and I, we, we made a covenant together as a husband and a wife, as a family, that we were going to give a biblical tithe to the church, that we were going to be obedient to what we believe God was telling us to do in our home. Since that time, not once have we ever not paid a bill. Since that time, there's never been an occasion where we haven't had food in our house, that we haven't been able to put clothes on our kids' backs. Now, I'm not saying that everything has, has always um, been wonderful and that we've lived in abundance. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that God has always taken care of us, and we expect God to always take care of us because He's our Father. And so it was natural for us in our first year of marriage, and, and I'm going to tell you that first year of marriage, again, I was 20. She was 19. So you can imagine what our income looked like. All right? Um, it, it was so strange. I think we we made less than $20,000 that first year that we were married. And both of us uh, applied for Pell Grants so we could continue our education. And Uncle Sam said we make too much money to qualify for Pell Grants. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Uncle, show me where it is because I'd like to know. But ever since that time when we decided to trust God at His Word, He's always been a home provider. Always. 
Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Paul says this, as we looked at this verse for the last five weeks in Galatians 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. One time as I was um, in the hospital, I think it was after I had my colon procedure done uh, a few years ago, that I was flipping channels on the TV because there's not a whole lot else you can do in the hospital. And came across this show, and I don't remember what network it's on. It's called Hoarders. Anybody ever seen that show? <clears throat> and as I watched that show, I thought, man, I, I know some people like that. You know? No one in this room. Okay? But I, can, I thought about my, my, my dad's mom, my grandma. Everywhere that she went, she collected trinkets. Everywhere my grandpa took her on a vacation or to see family or whatever, she had to buy something with the city and state on there so she could take it home and put it on a shelf somewhere in her house that was always at unkid-friendly level, and I wasn't allowed to touch it or play with it. That was torture, right? My mom's mom was quite the opposite. See, my grandma, she collected things based on places that they went that had significance so that she could always have something that would remind her of that time that she had with those that she loved. So she could relive those moments. My mom's mom collected stuff because she thought one day they would become valuable. You know what I'm talking about. Okay? For example, would never throw away a newspaper because there might be something historical written in that newspaper. And one day that newspaper may be worth a lot of money. Certain magazines that she subscribed to, that she kept every copy of, because there may be something of great importance that one day that magazine might be worth a lot of money. And the other stuff that she and my grandfather collected. And, and here's the strange thing. They lived in a very small three-bedroom house. They slept in one of the bedrooms. The other two bedrooms, quite literally, from the floor to the ceiling, stacked with junk. You said it. I didn't. I saw you. All right? It, it, it just could not throw anything away because we might be throwing away something that's a value. But here's the problem. All that stuff outlived her. And when she passed away, guess what? The family got left with a lot of thank you, junk. All right? Now, oftentimes, see, I watch a program like that, and it's very, very easy for me to criticize and even analyze and do all of those things of people that I see on TV. But quite honestly, you know, there's a lot of times spiritually where I do the exact same thing. That if I'm not careful, the blessings on which God gives to me, I find myself holding on to those blessings, unwilling to share those because those blessings were meant for me. And, and I become... Worried about, you know, it's kind of like the parable of the talents. Sometimes I'm like the one guy that got the one talent. And what did he do with the talent? He, he went and buried it. Why? Because he was afraid someone would either steal it or that he would misuse it or that he would lose it. And I find myself doing that with the blessings in which God gives me sometimes that I'm afraid of failure maybe. Or, or I'm afraid that maybe somebody will misuse my gift. And so I just, I keep it to myself and... And, and what begins to happen is, is then I, in hoarding God's blessings, I cut God's blessings off from my life. When you study uh, the topography or, or the ge geography of the nation of Israel, we read about this river 
oftentimes in the Old Testament. It's called the Jordan River. Anybody ever heard stories about the Jordan River in Scripture? Okay, the, the Jordan River, it, it, it flows south, and the Jordan River empties into a sea that we call It's called the Dead Sea. Because the Jordan River, as it flows down through the nation of Israel, it begins to rob the land of nutrients and of minerals. And those become deposited into what we call the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea because nothing ever flows out of it. And for those of you who maybe you study a little biology or marine biology, you know that. For, for water, it must constantly be moving in order to produce life. And so all of these minerals get deposited into the Dead Sea, but because the Dead Sea hoards all of those valuable uh, minerals and deposits and they never flow out, it becomes dead and it stagnates and nothing can live in that water. It goes nowhere. And there's a lot of Christians that I have met in my 27 years of ministry that because they hoarded the blessings of God, guess what they've become? Toxic. Smelling. Ever been around some? Why? Because all of a sudden they just... They hoard what God has given them and they're unwilling to, to let it go and to let God use it in their lives to bless those who are around them. What is the problem when we begin to hoard God's blessings? How does God look at us when we are unwilling to share what He's given us? Turn with me, if you will, to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. If you hold your place there, we're going to come back to it in just a moment. God, through his servant Malachi, he makes this statement in the form of a question. He says, Will a man rob God? And yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In ties and offerings. You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. See, when we refuse to give back, to let go of some of the blessings in which God has given us, God says that we are robbing Him. Robbing Him. So let me ask some questions that I had to ask myself through my weeks of study and preparation for this. Question number one. Am I stingy with my time? There's 24 hours a day, last I checked. Correct? So if I gave God 10% of my day, that's 2.4 hours. Right? Even in Texas math, that kind of turns out to be the same. Right, Ron? Right, 2.4 hours a day. That sounds, as, as I wrote that statement down, 2.4 hours a day, that sounds like a lot of time. I, and quite honestly, most of us, if, if you come to um, Sunday school or Bible study on Sunday mornings and then you attend worship and, and maybe, you, maybe you come back on Sunday night, you may be looking at 3.5 hours a week that we devote to God. But we're not talking about a week, we're talking about a day. It's so funny as I was talking about this in, in the first service, a man came up to me after the service. He said, you're not, you're not going to believe this. He said, at the moment that you begin to talk about time, he said, I got an alert on my iPhone. And he showed it to me. And it was a report from Siri. Don't you love her? And here's what the report said. Your average screen time for this week, 2.37 hours a day. And I, this is my response to him. I said, boy, you don't spend much time on your phone. Yes. <laughs> now think about that for a moment. If I just were to give God 2.4 hours of my day, how much screen time would I have to give up in order to accomplish that? But before 
before we go that far, let me just say this. What if I can change my perception about what I do each day? What if all of a sudden my job is just no longer a job in which I make money, but my job becomes my mission field? What if all of a sudden my, my home, my life, my, my, my time with my kids, my time at work, what if all of a sudden that becomes a place in where I go and do ministry? Am I looking at more than 2.4 hours per day? Say yes. So if I can change my perception about my daily life and I can take every moment captive and I can be intentional where I go into the workplace looking for ways that I can bring honor and glory to God, that I can exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Now I'm not just giving him 2.4 hours a day, but now I'm giving him all of my day. Think about how my life can change. Then I had to ask myself this question. Am I being stingy with my talents? Do I spend 2.4 hours of my day using my skills for the kingdom of God? Paul tells us, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. So if I can change my perception about my day, then quite possibly I'm spending anywhere from 12 to 15 hours of my day seeking ways that I can exalt the name of Jesus Christ. What if I let go? I let God use my talents in the workplace. I ask myself this question. Am I being stingy with my testimony? Am I willing to share what God has done in my life, what God is doing in my life? Am I willing to brag on Him everywhere that I go? Because people can make all kinds of arguments about what we believe, but the one thing they cannot argue against is what God has done for you. The one thing they cannot argue against is how God has radically changed your life. They can't make a case against that. Are you faithful in sharing your testimony? And then I ask myself this question. Am I being stingy with my treasures? Do I take a portion of what God has given to me and invest it in the lives of other people? By the way, everything that I have is not mine. It's His. Everything. Without God, I'd have not have the ability to work. Without God, I wouldn't have a life to live. Amen? And so everything that I have is God's, and all God asks us to give back is 10%. 10%. So this is how God views it when we hoard His blessings. And then this is how God reacts when we hoard his blessings. Look at James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, as a man, as I'm driving down the parkway or driving down 565 or whatever, and I see a single mom struggling to change the tire on her car, and I say, Would it be the right thing to do to pull over and help her change the tire? So when I know to do good and I do not do it, what is it called? Sin. When I see the guy that's standing out on the side of the road and he's got a month, he's got a sign, that money says we'll work for food. Or maybe it says I'm hungry and need food. And my first response is to judge him and to condemn him rather than feed him. What does the Bible say that's called? As I have an opportunity to do something good and I choose not to do it, it's called what again? It's called sin. Listen to what Jesus says. As he's talking to the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 25, it says then, and he's you know the flip side of the story, and so we're just going to concentrate towards the end of the story. When he will also say to those who are on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. And 
here's one. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And then they will answer and say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it. To me. That's how God reacts when we are stingy with the blessings that He gives us. And secondly, what is the purpose of our giving? Why do I give? Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, Bring all this tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That there might be something in which is useful to provide ministry. Now, to be quite honest, when Misty and I came to that conclusion in the first year of our marriage that we were going to give a biblical tithe, my motivation was because I wanted God to bless me. And so we're going to read the latter part of that verse in just a moment. So if I give and God has promised to bless, if I give, my motivation for giving is we're only making $20,000 a year and and I would really like to make more than 20,000 a year, God. And so I'm going to give a biblical tithe so that you can bless me. So that we can have more money. So that we can have more stuff. So that we can have a better life. But then as time went on, my prayer has begun to change and my mindset has begun to change. No longer do we give in order for God to bless us, but now we give because I want to be a blessing. I want to know that my life means something, that my contributions mean something. I want to know that as I slip money into a God's hand or, or maybe I do a compassionate deed for someone else or whatever, that I'm communicating the love of Jesus Christ. I want to make a godly impression so that my life is a blessing to someone else. So it's no longer I give because, God, I want you to do something for me. But now, God, I give because I want you to do something through me. Make me a blessing, O oh God. And so far as the church is concerned, we need people to give of their time so we can carry out the ministries of our church. We need people to give of their talents so we can carry out the ministries of our church. We need people to share their testimonies so that we can continue the ministries of the church. I, I've heard this statement all of my life that we are, that Christianity, the church, is one generation away from extinction. What happens if I never tell my kids my story of faith? What if I never tell my kids the gospel? What if I never share my faith with anyone? What can I expect to happen to the church? To Christianity. And we also need people to give up their treasures. Because a lot of the time, really frankly, most of the time, it takes money to make ministry happen. I don't like that. But that's the world that we live in. Now, let me say this, and please know my heart. Every year, it's about this time of year, we will sit down with the finance committee and we'll start working on our budget for next year. And every year, our budget is based on the previous year's giving. We have never based our budget off of what we would like to spend. It's always been about what has been given. Why? Because we want to be good stewards of the gifts you give to our church. Okay? So again, the motivation here is not personal motivation, it's not corporate motivation. Alright? Uh, this is kind of one of those areas where it's a hard truth sometimes for us to hear, but we need to hear it. And hopefully you'll see why a little bit more in just a second. Um, just for the sake of time, Tony, can we go to 1 Corinthians 16 and look at verse number 3? 
Paul instructs us in this passage to set aside a portion in which we can give as an offering on the first day of each week. And, and here's the reason why we give. So that when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. The believers in Jerusalem paid a high price for their faith in Jesus Christ. Many of them, when they confessed their faith in Jesus Christ, they were excluded from their family, which means their inheritance, their means, was taken from them, which means that they lived as paupers. And if you look at Acts chapter 2, for the sake of time, we're not going there. Acts chapter 2, these scriptures are in your bulletin, verse 44 through 47. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, offerings were collected among the universal church. To make sure that no one went without food, no one went without shelter, no one went without clothing. So everyone in the church sacrificed so that no one had to do without. That's why we give. So that we can meet the spiritual, the emotional, and the, and the physical needs of people. That's why we give. And finally, number three. Here's the promises of giving. Again, from Malachi chapter 3. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And this is the only time in Scripture where you'll hear God say this. The only time. Try me now in this. Different translation says, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, though he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And I read that and I've taught that Someone has always responded, but brother mine, that's Old Testament. And guess what? It is. But there's a consistent theme throughout Scripture. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 42. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And all God's promises, whether they're Old Testament or New Testament, are yes and amen. Scripture says that His Word is settled in heaven forever. So if God made you a promise concerning, test me now in this and see if I will bless you. Whether he says it in the Old Testament or the New Testament, his promises are yes and amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 9. Paul says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And notice this, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. My dad said it like this. You will never, never, ever outgive God. Ever. <coughs> and the moment that you try, guess what? <coughs> He'll say, nice try. That's the kind of God that we serve. A God who loves you enough to be all that we see Him to be in the New Testament. And now He's ready to do more for you and to do more through you. But you've got to 
trust him enough to do what he says to do. One of my favorite pastors to read and to listen to is Jim Simbala. He's the pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle. He's been there for over 27 years. Uh, actually, 37 years. In the early 2000s, Jim stood before his congregation and he preached a message on giving. There was a lot going on in the early 2000s. The start, stock market crashed because of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Remember those times? Jim stood before his congregation and out of love he shared the message on giving. He said, I've noticed something over my years of ministry that I have people that come in and they sit it in my office and they share stories about their life and they talk about their struggles. And one of the things that they continue to say is, Pastor, I just don't understand why it seems like that, man, I just keep hitting the wall. And then I just can't seem to get over it, around it. And it's like, man, I hit this wall and I, I can't just push through it. And man, I'm trying to make progress in my life, just physically, spiritually, and career-wise, and man, I just can't seem to get where I feel like I need to be. And so he tries to help these people find out what's going on in their life, and he begins to ask them some questions, and he said the majority of the time when he encounters people like this, there's one thing that they all have in common, is they have yet to develop Discipline giving, not just to the church, but just giving. And this is what he had to say to his church in the early 2000s. They like the faith to give. They come to God with clenched fists, pleading and demanding that God bless them. They are asking God for something that God already wants to do. But God cannot bless disobedience. So we must open up our hearts. We must open up our hands. And we must let God take control of what is rightfully His. And as we do, we're set free. receive the Lord as my personal Savior. There was a, a desire within me to become more like you. Uh, to be your original masterpiece. Uh, but Lord, there's this battle that I have with my flesh. Lord, and I find myself just like the, the guy that we saw in video, Lord, I, I want to hold on to things, and I want to control things, and knowing that my reluctance to let go is keeping me from being all that you want me to be. And Lord, although this is an uncomfortable message to give, it's necessary, God, in order for me to become who you want me to become, Lord, I've got to be willing to trust you.
speak to us. 